before I start, I'd like to um, ask you to please interrupt me at any point. Uh, as you can already see, I don't have terrible amounts of slides, so uh, <coughs> we, we can basically break into discussion at any point. So I'm going to talk about uh, meta tracing, RPython, and PyPy, which are basically the things that I've been working on since oh, 10 or 11 years now. And um, the motivation for this work is that, I mean, as you've seen this week, a lot of, most production VMs are written sort of by hand, painstakingly in C or C++, with a few, at the moment, more researchy exceptions. And um, they're very tedious and very costly to write. So the JVM has thousands of, the hotspot has thousands of person years of uh, effort, maybe not thousands, but 8,000 or something effort uh, gone into it, so, and it's, and it's a huge pile of very daunting and very terrifying C++ code, and so you, if you like open the folder, you, you really don't know what to do, like run away or um, take a machete, or um, I'm stealing that joke from Sava. Um, right, so, and that is particularly true if you have complex dynamic languages. I mean, you, you could argue, okay, the worst VM is, is Java, but uh, for dynamic languages, there are really a lot of added complexity because it's so hard to know anything about what's happening at runtime just by looking at the code. Um, so right, the, an important goal for VM construction is, is as, as we all know, is performance and you need a very a, a good just, just in time compiler for that. And um, indeed, as I already said, uh, particularly for dynamically typed languages where, where you don't know anything. Okay, so now you open the folder and you hope that okay, what, what, what kind of components could we expect there to be in a virtual machine? And you could kind of say, okay, we're implementing a language, so, so the, the language semantics of the language that we're implementing needs to be manifested somehow in the, in the VM. So there's a nice little box with the language semantics. We also have a JIT, so there should be a nice little box somewhere else that, that is the JIT compiler for, for the virtual machine that we're implementing. And the JIT has some kind of amount of optimizations on the side, and they should be sort of a little bit separated from the backend and everything. And all of that is sort of surrounded by the runtime which contains things like garbage collection and, and uh, like interfacing with the OS and stuff like that. But of course in practice, this nice little picture with, with cute boxes and, and colors and is not really true. It, like, in practice we have these C++ files and the problem there is, uh, in practice all that stuff is really messed and mashed together. Like um, all the concerns are really intermingled and entangled and they're very hard to sort of look at in isolation. Um, which, which means that changing these languages is, is really a lot of effort. So if, if you have a language that, that sort of is still evolving, like Python or, or um, JavaScript, I mean JavaScript has a lot of changes, um, it's very annoying and very hard to sort of figure out which bits of the runtime need to, you need to change because that's mashed up with the language semantics and which bits of the JITs you need to change, which bits of the JIT in code um, sort of specific assumptions about the language semantics that may no longer be true in a future version of the language. Can I interrupt? Yes, you please. Some interruptions. Thank you. Um, how much of this is due to the intrinsic um, complex nature of VM? How much is due to the, the problematic implementation languages we use? Oh, that's a very good question. I, I mean, I don't think we have enough experience with non, uh, with VMs that aren't written in, uh, yeah, but, <laughs> yes, to really answer that. But, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, speculate, yeah. go on, speculate. If you recommend that, you know. yeah, I would like to defer that because I, th I think some of the things that are very an annoying in a C++ implementation are actually kind of fun. Uh, if you use a higher level language, uh, I mean, and, and I guess the, the Truffle team would sort of corroborate that speculation, mm -hmm. but um, I mean, ultimately, it's speculation, right? Yep, I Lauren. There is a good discussion to be had there, but it seems Okay, so as I said, like if the language develops, it's <coughs> it's annoying to keep the JIT, JIT up to date with that development, and it can lead to a situation where so you have a nice new feature that everybody would really like to use, 
in the language, say, proxies in JavaScript. But um, all, the, all the JavaScript JITs don't really optimize it all that well. So um, you sort of, you would really like to use it because it sort of, from a modularity point of view, would be very natural for your program, but you can't for performance reasons and you're forced to use whatever previous feature existed. And, and of course, in the JavaScript world, it's particularly, it's even more annoying because different browsers might be at different points of optimization for new language features. So you, even if one of them does something good, you can't rely, you can't rely on, on all of them. Right, so, uh, if the language develops, we have a problem. And then the other problem we have is that oh, there's, there isn't just one language, even though some people might want that, which I think is a ridiculous goal anyway. But um, so if you have many different languages, it's really, really hard to share infrastructure between, between, between them, right? So it's not really easy to, say, take Luajit and rip the Lua bits out of it. Because uh, the fact that it's, it's jitting Lua is very, very deeply embedded and entangled in, in the way all these fancy bit encodings are, are being done. Um, so, right, so right now it's, it's, it's really not that, that easy to, to take a JIT for one language that has all the assumptions about that language sort of tangled in and apply to some completely yeah, different language. Right, so uh, what we would like to do in, in the research that I've, that I've been doing is basically to separate these concerns into to get a picture that is at least somewhat approaches the nice cute uh, picture with the boxes at the beginning. So we would like to separate the, the VM implementation concerns of language semantics on the one hand, um, but then a shareable and sort of reusable generic JIT compilation um, component that contains a set of generic optimizations that can be used for uh, a number of different languages. But then of course it's a little bit too optimistic to assume that you can write one optimizer that really fits everything. So in addition to um, this generic JIT uh, framework or generic JIT component, you also need a way to express language-specific optimizations so that the optimizer can basically reason about your language and, and optimize, optimize bits of your language according to, uh, yeah, according to the language semantics. Right, so, uh, and, and we've sort of been following an approach um, to try to achieve this goal, and, and that, is, that is the R Python project. It's a fairly old project. It was started in, I don't know, 2003 or something. Um, and the original motivation was basically, okay, we are, the people who started it were really serious Python people, and they said, okay, Python is good, and uh, so a lot of the other, Python should be used for a lot of things, so it should also be used to define itself, right? So to, uh, to define the, the semantics of the language in, within the language because that's cool and, hip and discrete people are doing it and it would be a nice way to explore how things work without having to look at RPC. So that was the original motivation, but then it, then it grew into a lot of different things. So right, so um, the approach that you take with, with RPython is that basically RPython is the language that you use to implement in interpreters. So um, you take any language and you, that you want to implement, and then you write an interpreter for it in RPython. And RPython is a, is a subset of Python, right? So it, on the service level, it's really just, it just looks like Python, but it has a number of restrictions. That's where the R comes from. It, it means restricted Python. And those restrictions are needed in order to be able to take your RPython interpreter and turn it into a C program, right? So you, you do type inference and optimization and all kinds of fancy stuff, and you take the RPython interpreter, you make C out of it. And then you, you haven't really gained that much, right? But uh, at least you, you, you're, running, you're running your interpreter not on, on a slow in other interpreter, but you have a C program and you have a C-based interpreter for, for your language. Um, and of course, during this translation process, a lot of magic needs to happen. And the most, like, the most obvious one is basically when you take the interpreter and translate it to C, there needs to be a GC coming from somewhere. Because our Python is garbage collected, so um, if, if you translate things to C, you need to sort of insert a garbage collector um, into, into the final C binary, right? And, and as I said, it, um, the most mature um, language that we have applied this to is, is Python itself. So we've, we've written PyPy, which is basically this, this rather mature and long-running project to write a Python interpreter in R Python. Uh, it has tons of contributors. It's uh, relatively successful and used in industry and whatever. Right. Yeah. While well, we're academics, we, we, in a sense, we don't have to care, but it's a nice, it's, it's, uh, it's nice to show real-world impact or something. 
Right. Um, so, okay, but now we, we haven't actually won anything. We, we turned the very slow interpreter in RPython into a somewhat less slow but still interpreter in C. So, and, and right, okay, interpreter, writing interpreters has been easy, kind of easy anyway, so what, what have we won? And so the interesting thing is really the next step. In the next, in the next step, um, we use something that we call the meta tracing approach to these RPython interpreters to, to really get a JIT for them without having to write one for every language. And the, the idea for that is when you translate your interpreter from RPython to C, you add an extra component automatically that's completely independent of the specific interpreter that you're translating. It's just, it exists, the RPython people have written it, uh, and they've done like hard work to get it somewhat decent. And the idea is that you don't, as an interpreter author, you really don't have to care too much about uh, the generic just in time compilation infrastructure, like backends, interfacing with the garbage collector, talking to the, garbage, uh, to the operating system to get like executable pages and, and threads and the threading story is not that good, but uh, still. Right, so, and of course it's a little bit too optimistic to hope that you can just insert this generic JIT and it magically works for any language. So it, it's not quite that magical. But when you write your interpreter, in order to be able to get a JIT, you need to sort of communicate with the, with the translation process that inserts the JIT a little bit. You need to give it some sort of extra information to say, okay, hello, my program is an interpreter, and this is where certain components of the interpreter are. And I, I'll get to how that looks like in, in more detail later. So that's, that's the red stripes here. Uh, actually, the other stripes that will come in later are invisible on the projector. So. Um, right, uh, okay. So uh, in addition to sort of the, the, the usual backends and, and stuff, this, this generic JIT also has a sort of the standard set of optimization that you would expect, like constant voting and dead code elimination. And, uh, and then a, a few more specific ones to dynamic languages, but I'll also talk to them uh, about them a little bit later. Right, so, so what's this meta-tracing thing? Uh, thankfully, my task has, uh, is a lot easier because Lara gave, gave the Lua JIT talk yesterday, so I, you all already know what tracing is, right? That's perfect. Um, <laughs> Uh, so no, no, I'm, I'm still going to talk about tracing a little bit. Um, so tracing JITs are this, uh, by, not, by, by now not really that recent idea anymore, but uh, they're basically this great dream. So you have an interpreter, it exists, it's mature, it's perfect, but it's not fast enough. So what you do is you, you just add a little component at the side, which, is a, you, which, which you write specifically to your interpreter, which is um, this, this weird tracing thing, right? And the idea is, you, when you start your program, you, 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 you start out interpreting your code. But while you interpret, you also do a little bit of lightweight profiling to figure out where your long running and important loops are. And um, when you found them, when you, when you found those loops, you switch into a special interpretation mode where the interpreter still runs. But in addition to actually uh, running your program, it also keeps this trace um, that we've seen extensively, extensively in, in Java's talk. So basically, in addition to in Slava's talk, in addition to just running the program, it also keeps a kind of log of all the bytecodes or all the operations that the interpreter executed to run that loop. Um, right, so that, that's basically what you look like. like you, you, you take your interpreter, you write a small cute component side that, that is able to observe the interpreter, then you, you need some, an optimizer and a backend. But, um, but, but basically, the idea, so that the dream was that most of the semantics and most of the runtime can be shared with the interpreter. Right, so the, the, the trace, as I said, is basically a log of bytecodes until you, you've reached um, a point that you've seen earlier in the trace, so you close the trace, you insert a dump to the beginning, and you're done. And you ship that off to the optimizer on the back end, and you have a, a nice piece of sampler that's great and fast and everything. <coughs> right, so of course, let's, let's look at an example. This is a lot more, and this is a hypothetical tracer, so it, it can be nice and, and harmless. So if you have this kind of program in a dynamically typed language, uh, in order to be able to do the x smaller than zero comparison, you first need to figure out what the types of, of these things are. So um, the, what the bytecode will do is it will, it will check, okay, ah, x happens to be an int. So you add a, a type guard that says, I observed that x was an int while I was tracing, so I, I add that type guard. Then you have a type guard that zero is int, well, obviously, 
and then you have a bar that says uh, x is smaller than zero because during tracing we happen to take um, wait uh, we happen to take this path right uh, and then to, in order to do the, the the plus you need more type guards x is an int two is an int then you do the integer addition some details are left out here like unboxing and stuff and then you um, for then you here you you do the x plus 3. For that, you again need to check that x is an int and 3 is an int, and then you do, do plus 3. Okay, that's the unoptimized trace. And then as a next step, you would basically optimize that. I mean, it's kind of obvious what to do here. You have all these repeated type checks, and obviously you don't need them. And you don't need them for constants either. And you, you can probably like realize that if you add 2 and then 3, you can immediately add 5. Again. Right, so, so that's that's kind of... That's kind of the idea, and as you see, sort of points where we, uh, places in the trace where we speculate about types of things, we added these type guards, and places in the code where we, where we, in code control flow, I mean, the tracer can only follow one path because it's really very concretely observing what the, what the interpreter has been doing. I mean, it, it, it doesn't really know anything more about the program than following the inter along with the interpreter. So, all the places where control flow could have diverged. We need to insert another guard that says, oh, if, if, if we would take the if path instead, yeah, you need to fail that guard and go back to the interpreter. Right? So, uh, guards. Uh, as I said, conditions in like control flow conditions are turned into guards, and type checks are turned into guards, and those check that the control flow is followed, and when they fail, you go back to interpretation. And actually, this is a, this is a, a fun place because all the tracing papers and, and everybody who talks about tracing completely hand waves at that place. Right? Oh, when they fail, it's very easy. You just go back to interpretation. But of course, that is completely non-trivial, as, as we saw in Jill's talk yesterday. It's a deoptimization point. You need to reconstruct the interpreter state. Uh, that is very complex. And uh, you need to encode the, uh, the, the information how to do that efficiently, because otherwise you will have hundreds of megabytes of, of this uh, state description and stuff. Anyway, I will hand wave and say it's easy. You just go back to the interpreter. Um, right. Yeah? Good. The side traces for commonly failing guards. Did you read about diamonds and loops that actually have diamonds that are really both sides being taken? It's, it's a pain point. Um, so the problem is you really completely, you never merge within the trace, right? Not most That's of the tracing jits. question. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> most of the tracing jits don't. And whether that's a good idea or not is unclear. Yeah. And it's probably, there are definitely cases where it's not, right? Where it's really bad. But yeah. Are you doing at this point profiling to see how many times you take the if and the yes. S and then based on that? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so we don't. So right now, if, if, if you're executing a loop and you always took the if while interpreting, but then while you trace, you took the else, then you're statistically unlucky and. Um, and you're not happy. But anyway, so what I'm, uh, let me describe what happens when a, a guard actually fails, right? So when a guard fails, you, you keep a counter on the guard saying, oh, uh, it really fails a lot. So going back to the inter interpreter is not going, is not a good idea long term. So what you do instead is you start tracing from the point where the, star, where the guard fails. And then you add a new trace starting from there, following along the interpreter again, and then patching the original, um, the original guard to not jump back to the interpreter, but instead jump directly to new, the new trace and run from there. Right. But indeed, the merge really only happens when when you hit sort of the beginning of the original trace again. So it, it's very it, it splits paths very aggressively. Right. Um, so one thing that that I want to stress here that is not always immediately obvious is that one very cool property of this tracing thing is that it's really, really aggressive at inlining. Because, so the, the example doesn't, the example trace doesn't actually contain a call, but if you have a call here, you would not record a call in the trace. Instead, you would start interpreting the call function and trace that, right? So the trace is really the, 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 the control flow through all the functions that you may be calling in your outer loop. Um, and of course, you need to stop at some point because you, you don't want to unwind any loops that, that you reach, right? But so, uh, for just a second. But, um, but
But the basic idea is really that you very aggressively trace through all the paths of call functions that you encounter while tracing. Good. What do you do with virtual calls that have multiple targets and different iterations? Uh, they, they, turn, they turn into guide, uh, type cards, right? And then, I mean, it, it really, it's really all, all mapped to these primitives. Did you observe that you went through a call by putting a guard down? Right. You know, for, in front of a virtual call, you need to put a guard with the concrete class that you saw. Right. And then, then the rest of the trace is basically the inline method and right. right. And that means for all the monomorphic call side, the right thing happens. Um, because you immediately inline, and, and only if you discover that, right, you have thousands of other classes here, you need to do something else. And I mean, the idea is simple. So if you have a type guard that, that fails a lot, you, you would see that, oh, I'm seeing thousands of classes here, so it may not be a good idea to uh, attach thousands of side traces and do something else. Right. But yeah, we, I mean, big plus point, very aggressive and, and very nice and naive. Okay, so let's talk a little bit sort of about, about uh, the execution states of a, a VM with an interpreter and a tracing JIT. So um, as I said, you start interpreting your program, uh, you run up there and you, you keep profiling and at some point you say, oh, this, this program counter seems to happen a lot. So I start tracing, I go here, I trace one loop iteration. So then I optimize it, emit it, and immediately run it, right? Because since I've been tracing a loop, after I emitted, emitted it, I immediately know that I'm still in that loop, so I can just jump to the assembler. So I run the trace, and the only way to actually, actually exit the trace is via a guard figure. There is, um, I mean, by default, it's, it's, in, it's turned into an infinite loop, right? Just with guards inside. So the loop conditions, the loop exit conditions are expressed as guards. So you will run this trace basically until you, something fails. And then if something fails, if there is no side trace attached, you go back to the interpreter. And then the next thing, the, the next edge that we can talk about is that um, you're in the interpreter and um, you hit a trace while interpreting that you already produced, right? So you had a program counter where you already have code and then you do the transfer in the opposite direction. You just jump to the already existing assembler which is that trace. And then the other thing I already, already said is that if you run a trace and you, you fail a guard that has been failing lots of times already, you, instead of going back to the interpreter, just start tracing from there, patch the side trace, and then, and then go back, and then keep running. And in, in that way, sort of over time, you get a covering of all the control flow paths in your program that you take sort of often enough to, um, yeah, Richard? And an exception is probably another go of failure that really depends. So different tracers have sort of different opinions on that. So for us, we just, if there's an exception that like is raised every time you call something, you would just trace the unwinding, right? So that would be, I mean, you get zero cost exceptions that way, but um, I, I don't know what, what Luajit does, but, uh, but I think we're, we're a little bit alone with that decision. So, um, and if, there, if, there's, if you put a call in there that could have an exception, it's followed by a guard no exception that checks that you're still on trace, and if not, you you leave and go to the exception handler. Right. Um, okay, so <coughs> dream in practice. In, in practice, uh, the components of the tra tracing JIT, which was supposed to be this nice little box at the side of the interpreter, are still really get deeply embedded into the interpreter, and we've seen quite a bit of that in Slava's talk yesterday, which is that for every bytecode in Lua JIT. There is this very complex logic that expands it to, to um, SSA operations. And that logic, uh, he told me, is also sometimes amusingly buggy. So the be behavior is different than what the interpreter actually does when running the bytecode. And then you can get very amusing bugs. So um, for every bytecode, you basically hit the, um, the author basically hit very carefully had to uh, write code that expands that bytecode into a number of SSA operations, also depending on the concrete types that you've seen at runtime, because uh, tracing is the type feedback uh, mechanism of, of uh, tracing JIT. Right, and, and of course, yeah, the, the other problem, the other two problems also still exist. I mean, if you, if you want, if Lua did involve, uh, if Lua evolves, Lua JIT is not having much fun. Like, if Lua, if Lua were to add lots of new types, then uh, suddenly, all the careful bit whittling would, would have to be completely redone. So um, 
uh, sort of standard tracing JIT does not necessarily solve that problem. And it's also, again, not necessarily clear how you would reuse uh, an existing tracing JIT for another language. Right. Okay, so solution, uh, or solution, the, the, the approach that we've been taking is that instead of sort of bolting on a uh, tracing component to, in, uh, like integrating it into the interpreter, the idea is that we write this generic tracing component that sort of sits below the interpreter and that can basically observe everything that the in interpreter is doing, including all the implementation. So instead of trace, having a trace that basically consists of the bytecode of the interpreter, so you have like add and mole and whatever, it really um, traces through the implementation of the bytecode. And in that way, the, the, the semantics of the language is completely transparent to the tracer. So, um, and then that, that means that it's really tracing sort of the implementation functions that the author of the language wrote in the interpreter as opposed to sort of um, being added manually to the interpreter. And that means also means that the nature of the trace changes. The trace does no longer contain operations that um, sort of correspond to the bytecodes of the, the interpreter that we happen to have. Instead, it really contains operations that are within the implementations of these bytecodes. And it also uh, means that the extent of the trace changes. Because before, a trace is as long as a loop in the user program. But now, the, the trace is as long, it, it traces many, many iterations of the main bytecode dispatch loop and, and traces through many very different bytecodes. And it stops tracing only when you really hit a program counter in there that you've seen before. So the sort of the uh, loop end condition is similar, but the level at which you trace is, is one level down. Right, um, so I promised earlier that I would talk a little bit about how you concretely go and add hints to your interpreter that you've written in R Python in order to be able to enable this meta tracing thing. And I mean, the, the observation is that usually, usually an interpreter in R Python looks like this. You have some kind of loop. It's some kind of bytecode dispatch loop. You have a while loop, and, it, and it, the structure is always roughly the same. You load the next instruction at the current program counter, and then you, you have some kind of switch that checks for the different bytecodes that your language interpreter happens to have. And then like you have a pop instruction that pops stuff from the stack influence the program counter. And then one of these instructions is some kind of branch where basically you uh, load an offset and, and add it to the PC, something like that. Right? So um, the structure of a lot of bytecode languages are similar enough to this that yeah, that, that we can sort of see how things might work. Does um, it make a difference if you have a case statement at the jump table? Uh, it, it's, it's, also, okay. it's all the same. I mean, also, so aside, I'm going to talk mostly about bytecode interpreters, but that's not a fundamental limitation. The fundamental limitation is that somewhere in your interpreter, you need some kind of loop, right? And that loop can be about bytecodes. It can be, even, even AST interpreters have loops somewhere because they implement the while, uh, the while construct of the language some, somewhere, and, and then there they need a, a loop at the, at the interpreter level, right? So as, as long as you have some kind of loop in the interpreter level that does stuff, you can apply, apply the operating approach. So what, what do you need to do? What you need to do is you need to, you need to tell RPython what the important loops, like the, the dispatch loops of your interpreter in the program are. So because for, for the RPython translator, it's not obvious which of the many loops that your interpreter might have are the loops that actually do bytecode dispatching, right? It could be the loop that adds two strings, right? And you don't want to did that. So uh, what you need to do is you need to add a, a hint that says, here, this thing, this while here, is, um, is the interpreter loop. And that, that's, that's just something that you, a method call that you add as like the first statement in the body of that loop. Mm. The other thing that you need to do is you need to be able to give the tracer a way to recognize when it has seen enough iterations of the bytecode dispatch loop so that a loop at the user level is being finished. And, and that hint usually goes in, in the branch instructions, right? Because the only way that you can get a repeated program counter is, I mean, if you just increment the program counter, you will never repeat one. So the only way to to reach a previous program counter is with the help of a branch instruction that jumps backward. So you add a hint that basically says, in the branch of code, if the offset that I'm jumping to is, is negative, 
then there's this other obscurely named hint uh, that says, okay, if you end up here, it's a, it's a point where you might potentially have just closed the loop. And at those points, um, those are the points where profiling will happen, because you don't want to profile on every bytecode. You only want to do it at loop headers or loop ends. So uh, here you will have some kind of hash table of counters or something that says, oh, I've seen this PC 700 times, let's start tracing. Uh, and those are also the points where the tracer will check whether it has seen the same PC previously in the trace and, and is able to close the loop. And with these two hints, you get the tracer works, right? With these two hints, you, you can get the tracer to look at all your bytecodes, to produce a trace out of them, and to get a uh, assembler that matches the semantics of the language that you've implemented, that you've expressed in that interpreter, sort of independently of the interpreter. Um, and, right, so, one problem is that, that you can see here, if you look at this thing, is that, okay, you have the trace that expresses, like, that really expresses the semantics of the user level loop, but you still, the tracer also still sees a lot of these sort of data structures that are specific to the interpreter, and the most obvious one here is the stack, right? So the interpreter and the tracer will trace through the implementation of that stack.pop function. And you might say, okay, that's probably, not, that's probably bad because your trace will contain stack pops and, and you really want to turn that into something more efficient. But it actually turns out that with not a lot of work, you can completely uh, optimize that overhead of all the interpreter data structures away and, and really get a trace that corresponds quite naturally to the code that you're running on, on the very top. Right. Um, so the next step is you have a trace and then you just apply the typical compiler optimizations. And uh, a, a cool observation about traces is that it's completely trivial to write optimizations for them, right? Because it's basically a single very large uh, basic block with side exits, but they don't, you, you really don't care about them because you, you're just gone, right? So you can just go, it's, all our optimizations are a single pass you go down from top to bottom, you throw out things that you've already seen, like if you have a repeated type check, uh, you just throw it out. Uh, you constant forward, it's simply, uh, and, and all kinds of things are really very simple. Um, the only thing that needs a backward pass is, is dead code elimination because you need to figure out um, whether something is still being used further down. Second. Yeah? Do you do anything with a loop? You have a loop. Uh, like loop invariant code machine. We do. We use the same trick as Luajit, which you missed yesterday. But um, <laughs> the idea is, is really that you, you peel one iteration off, and then you move all the stuff that repeated. Right. So the only optimization that's, that used to be less common nowadays, a lot of kids have it, is a really, really strong and robust um, escape analysis. Um, escape analysis, again, gets very simple because you just have a trace, right? You don't need to, you don't need to deal with control flow merges where the, where the escaped state might be different on the two paths. You really just go from top to bottom, you see allocations, you can optimistically remove them or push them further down until the point where things really escape, where you need to, where you need to like, really allocate the object. But for, in most cases, for a lot of the allocations that you see in dynamic languages, that's completely unnecessary. And there's a, there's a very clear case where, where that becomes obvious, which is that uh, in a lot of dynamic t languages, your, your primitives are boxed, right? So every integer is a, uh, is a little heap cell that you allocate, so arithmetic will allocate a lot of boxes. And, uh, but if you, if you look at these allocations in the trace, it's completely obvious that those boxes don't live long, because if you have uh, a plus b times c, you will allocate a box for the b, d times c, b times c object, right? But that is not going to live long. The point where it's, it's going to be consumed by the plus, right? So um, it's, very, it's very simple and trivial to remove the allocation of those boxes. And I mean, in the beginning, we wrote this optimization for that kind of sort of use case. But it turned out that it's really powerful and useful for the kind of usage patterns that people do in dynamic languages, where you just throw out tons of instances and lists and tuples, and you just make them, and they live for like uh, a method call or two, and, and then they just die again. And, um, the allocation removal is just able to very efficiently get rid of all of them, right? Okay, so, so far, everything, the communication between the, oh, let me actually drink something. 
Oh, I can also halt and ask whether there are more questions. Here's a question about... You looked like you had one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? So, you know you said at the beginning, you know, thousands of man hours or something is going to be VMs. So what about this sort of method tracing approach? Is that um, easier to... Mm, right. No, 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 it's not. But the, but the hope is that you just need to do it once. What was the question? I couldn't Oh, sorry. The question is, is, meta, is, meta, is writing the meta tracer actually easier than writing some other JIT? And I think the answer is no. I mean, in a sense, it's harder, right? Because you need to be generic. Um, but, oh, oh, I mean, I, I, I really don't want to compare our stuff to Hotspot, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the, the, the idea really is it may be hard, but um, you, really, you can really reuse it. And I'm going to show some examples later of how we can or uh, did reuse it for uh, different and not completely obvious contexts, right? Another question? Okay, no, yeah. When you're touching some yeah, resting point with a with the side trace, mm -hmm. how do you take care like all the way from the other state between the traces? Like oh, that's the, that's like at low level it would be like some kind of register mapping No, that's that? fine. Basically you you need to know the register mapping for the guard anyway, because you need it to transfer so the, the interpreter. So you reinitialize the register allocator with the state at that point. Okay. So there are no moves. Proceeds to be as it was there. And then, right, and so that, I mean, at the guard failure point, there are no moves. There might be moves necessary when you jump to some other trace then later, right? But, um, so the failure just, it just, it's just a jump and then the new code just keeps running. Right. Okay, so um, as I said, all the stuff so far, it, it's picking up the language semantics correctly, but it doesn't really know much about sort of the more language-specific optimizations that might be necessary to get a specific language fast, because it's, it's a little bit too optimistic to hope that everything can be expressed in this complete and beautiful optimizer. Um, so the, I'm going to talk next about how, you, how the interpreter author can express language-specific um, knowledge to, to, the to the optimizer chain, because, I mean, that's, that is usually necessary. And what you can't see here is that there are these little barcode yellow stripes that, that are basically hints in the interpreter that don't, commute with, don't uh, communicate with the tracer, but instead with the optimizer. And right, so um, why do we use JITs at all? I mean, we use JITs because uh, as opposed to a static compiler, we can at any point look at the values of the program in addition or, or the, the control flows that we happen to see in the concrete program run that, that we're running which might be a very, very small subset of the potentially possible um, uh, control flows that, that you might guess about just statically looking at, at the program. So, um, and, and bare meta tracing cannot really do that on its own because for the, for the meta tracer, all kinds of variables in the trace are equivalent. And the meta, for the meta tracer, it's not really a, a different thing to actually hand around an object or its class, right? And of, but of course, in practice, you want something very different to happen when, when you're actually doing operation on the class, because if you're doing stuff on the class, you can assume that you only see few classes, whereas on an object, you, of course, are not going to see a few of them. So, and, and this kind of distinction needs to be expressed by the language uh, author somehow. And um, those hints are usually uh, not used to express something about the language semantics, but they're quite often exp uh, used to express uh, something about how the language happens to be used in practice. And that is not necessarily uh, apparent in just by just looking at the interpreter. Um, and, and the standard, I mean, the standard uh, example is really, is really monomorphic sense. Uh, so if you, if you have a method call site, it's not really obvious a priori that you would only ever see uh, few classes here, right? I mean, when people started implementing uh, object-oriented language, languages, I mean, it's not really obvious that in practice most method call sites are only see one concrete implementation of a method. I mean, it's imaginable that people would write, start writing really, really weird programs where at every call point uh, you see hundreds of different methods, right? 
But empirically, it has been shown that that's really not the case. Empirically, almost all call sites are monomorphic. And, and um, so it's a very good idea to try to specialize every call <laughs> site to the class that you see in practice. Cliff. So 20 years of Java, 95% of calls that the optimizer has to admit that they didn't get statically inline. Uh, inline caches uh, hit and stay valid for 95% of the call sites. And the other 5%, they go megamorphic, usually with a lot. Not with two or three, but with right. 20. Right. But yeah, but I mean, in those, you, you want to do something good about those 95% to start with. Because otherwise, you're, you're not happy. I mean, if, if you just say, oh, I have a call site. Let's emit code that does the method lookup. Then, yeah, no. Uh, right. So let's, let's think about what, what a, a bit of like, theoretical piece of an interpreter for such an object-oriented language might look like. And basically, here's the, here's the function that implements method sending in the interpreter. And uh, method sending is basically an operation that takes an object and a name of a message and some arguments, which might be a list or something more complicated like a Python. And what you do in the send is you, you, you ask the object for its class, and you store it in the class variable, and then you basically call a lookup function, which I've takes just the class and the message name, which does complicated cl class walking, goes up the class hierarchy, contains all kinds of weird code in, in various dynamic languages. And then what you do then is you get back a method object or some kind of error, which I'm ignoring here. But if you get back a method, you call it and you're done. Right? So and what you want to express here is that um, the first thing you want to express is that we expect there to be few classes here. Right? So and, and you communicate that with, a, with the help of the first thing, which, which we call promote. And promote is basically called promote because it promotes a variable into a constant. So, um, and how that works is when you trace that kind of code for a specific uh, call site, what you will do is you will peek at the concrete runtime value of the class and produce a guard that says, oh, the class is this, this concrete pointer that I saw during tracing. And then, uh, and then you keep going. So the other thing that you now need is you still have that lookup. You, you, you probably know the message name, and you now, with the help of the promote, you know the class. But you still don't know whether the, whether the um, classes in your language are actually immutable, right? It could be possible that you have a weird language like Python, where at runtime, at any point, you can just change the methods of a class, right? But, uh, and actually, just looking at the implementation of lookup is usually not enough to give you that information. Because lookup will probably walk up some class hierarchy and look into various hash maps, and the hash maps are, of course, in theory, mutable. And the fact, the fact that they happen to not be mutated at runtime is not necessarily obvious by just looking at the interpreter. Mm. So the other annotation that you can give here is saying, in, in this language, classes are immutable. So um, that means. Uh, if I see a, a call to lookup with a constant class and a constant method name, I can just constant for it. <coughs> and that's what you, what's, that's what you need the, the second annotation for. The second annotation basically says, if in the trace you have a call to lookup with a constant class and a constant method name, just um, take the result that you saw uh, at tracing time. And th that means if you trace this code, you will get a trace that says, oh, check that the class is this concrete class over there, and then you just immediately inline the method that you that you called them. So that's nice. So is that's basically. Hmm? Is this polymorphic? Uh, well, it's just a guard. But the idea of if you build a polymorphic cache, it's always like monomorphic. Well, it's a guard. It's neither. I mean, it's it starts. I mean, it's really it's just comparing the in a guard comparing the pointer against constant, right? So it starts out, but then you might attach side traces if if you okay, see more. Okay. Hmm? Yes. Which it, okay, there are tons of details that I'm happy to talk about, particularly this bit, because I'm, I mean, I'm actually right now doing some more work on right, that stuff. But uh, the, the default model is really just, you, you put it in the trace, and then you attach side traces if, if you see more values. And if you see tons of values, you don't, because that would be stupid. But, um, right. Okay, so that, that's basically it. I mean, with those two hints, you can express a ton of things. And it's not, I mean, it's not completely obvious how you would express all of them, like all of the tricks that dynamic languages do. But uh, we found very few things that dynamic languages runtimes do that we cannot express with, I mean, 
with, with those two things. And, I mean, in practice, we have a few more variants of those that are sort of slightly different, but the basic idea is, is those two things. Was that a question? You're looking very quizzical again. Right. Okay, so let's, let's hold here again and, and uh, see whether there are other questions. Yeah, just a naive one. Uh, when you run the interpreter, uh, it should interpret a program, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, does it matter what program you are interpreting with it or when you build the trace? Because the interpreter, when it runs, it runs something, right? It runs on the program. No, I mean, it, no? it should not matter. Uh, I mean, that, what do you mean, w w should it matter? I mean, I don't understand the question. Uh, so, you have an interpreter, right? But the interpreter, let's say for Python, would mm -hmm. run a Python program, yes. right? Um, does it matter what that program that the interpreter runs uh, is, or it doesn't? Well, it will trace that program concretely, right? I mean, the, the tracer traces the interpreter while it's running that program. So you get a trace that corresponds to the loops in that program. Mm -hmm. So yes, it doesn't matter. I mean, so would that be interesting to run uh, in a language like uh, Python, in which you can interpret the language in itself? Oh, you mean you mean what happens if the if the top level program is itself an interpreter? Uh, right, right. Uh, the same interpreter actually. Would oh. that extract more information? Uh, so in interpreters are sort of notoriously not that. Uh, nice for tracing JITs. So um, it would still speed it up, but probably, it, I mean, it wouldn't collapse the layers. But it's another topic that I, that I find very interesting, so we can, um, so it would be cool if, if you could just build stacks of these, like, I mean, at least academically cool, maybe not practically cool. Um, so it would be cool if you could, like, collapse a whole stack of interpreters down to just the trace that corresponds to the very topmost program, right? No, uh, but that, that's more than, uh, than I was hoping. I no. was just uh, curious if, for instance, if you run uh, a Python interpreter uh, interpreting itself, that would give you more information or higher level information no, on those loops than... I, I can uh, make a much weaker statement. If, you're, if you do this with Prolog and a meta-interpreter for Prolog, you get the same assembler as for the original program. So for Prolog it works. But that's, the reason for that is because the Prolog meta-interpreter is so tiny, right? So, Anyway, um, okay, anything else? Any other question? Right, so um, let's, so now we understand how the metadata works, right? So now we can, now we can look at how we used it. Um, and now we, we get back to sort of the beginning and, and that's, I mean, it's a slide we already had, but with R Python and PyPy swapped in the title, right? So now, now let's talk about PyPy. Um, and as I said, historically, it was how the R Python program um, project got started. And in the beginning, we didn't really think about writing a JIT, right? We just wanted, uh, like, for educational reasons, uh, Python interpreter and R Python. And then we said, oh, maybe we can bootstrap it to C, then it's fast. But of course, if you just bootstrap it to C, it's not fast, it's even slower than C Python. Uh, and then basically, more ideas about how to add this generic JITing framework <coughs> were, were invented. Uh, so PyPy is basically a, a relatively large and very compatible implementation of 2.7. Um, it has a quite big developer, open source developer community, plus some people that do it semi-commercially or commercially, plus some uh, academics. Um, it's about, the Python interpreter itself is about 60,000 lines of R Python code, plus like big amounts of standard library modules. Uh, some of which are, I mean, the ones that are implemented in Python, we just copy from, from C Python. But those that are implemented in C and C Python, we had to re-implement in R Python. Um, we nowadays have support for um, uh, having some kind of emulation layer for also running C extension modules for, uh, that were written for the C Python C extension API, which is really hard to sort of um, get working because they, they have all kinds of weird details locked in like reference counting and whatnot. But it, it kind of works. Right, so, um, but let's ignore that. That's practical stuff. So let's, let's talk about um, PyPy in conjunction with the rest of the scene, the things we've seen. So in the PyPy interpreter, in those 60,000 lines of code, they're about, in addition to the hints that, that um, point out the bytecode dispatch loop, 
there are about 400 hints that are of the promote or elitable form. And it's basically a continuous process to, to add more. I mean, it's not like we add 400 next week, right? But I mean, we might add two or something. So, and I mean, the development process usually is, you have some kind of language feature that a customer or some random program that you found somewhere that does not really, that is not really jitted well enough, right? So what you do is you, you think about in which way you would like to optimize that language feature better by looking at the trace and looking at the implementation of that, uh, of that feature in the interpreter and then thinking of, about how can we use the, like, the building blocks that the JIT gives us to express, the, like, to express optimizations for that language feature. And um, obviously we're mostly concerned with sort of the, the traditional core language features of, of the Python language. And I mean, just as a few examples, um, it, of course it's very op um, important to optimize things like global lookups down to like nothing because global, globals are very rarely mutated. So you basically can assume almost always that the global lookup is just like, should not produce any hash map lookup, right? Because that's, that's expensive. Uh, on the other hand, do you, you want to do all the usual tricks that you do in dynamic languages for, for the optic model, like you, we have hidden classes and uh, tricks to get attribute reads and method calls and, and stuff like that um, efficient. Uh, and for that it's necessary to, uh, because Python does not have that nice simplifying uh, state of things that classes are immutable. So in Python you can at any point just add new methods to a class, change existing methods, change the inheritance hierarchy, you can say oops. Surprise, A now inherits from C instead of B. Uh, and then you need to sort of invalidate all, carefully invalidate all the code that, um, that relied on the assumption that A was really a subclass of B. Um, so there, we, we use hints for that. And then we also have quite a bit of support for, um, for specializing containers, specializing data structures to the concrete, um, to the concrete uh, values that you store in them at runtime. So if you if you make a list that just stores int, you, the list switches to a specialized implementation that stores the int in an unboxed way um, in order to be able to not have to allocate a little box when you actually, like a, an int box when you put a new int into that list. And then but if, some, if somebody comes and stores an, uh, a string in there, then too bad, you need to go over the list again and, and, and box everything. And, but um, that kind of stuff is, is in conjunction with the tracer, produces very nice effects so that, that if you really have sort of traditional array -E code that just iterates over lists of floats and, and does some arithmetic and stores them back, you get relatively nice traces. Yes? So I have a question. So when you say that uh, when something is broken, you need to invalidate some code, mm -hmm. how do you determine the, the portion of the code that was affected in order to meet rules? So I've not really completely talked about that hint. Um, in a sense, so, so what you do is you version your classes. The, the basic approach is that you give every class a version, like which is just, you can imagine that it's a number, it's already a number, it's, it's more like, and if, basically, if anything changes that could uh, affect that specific class, like some, ba by, uh, some base class adds a method, or some, uh, you change the, the hierarchy or something, you need to, in, in the interpreter, you need to find all the class versions that you need to change. And if you do that, the tracer will know that all those, all those classes that had their version changed, it will know all the traces that read those versions. And, and then throw them out and, and trace again if, if that code becomes important again. So it's at the object level it, I mean, from, from, uh, from the point of view of the author of the interpreter, you don't really have to care about the traces, right? You just say, I have this version field, and if that changes, um, you should, like the JIT needs to, there, there's a hint that basically says, this field will change very slowly. And if it changes, the JIT will do all the, the work of figuring out what code actually depends on that field, right? Right, uh, another question? Right, uh, to actually give you a flavor of why some of that is not fun. Um, I'm going to show, I mean, Python looks cute and cuddly from the outside, sort of. But um, when you look at how some of the, the semantics of some of the object model operations, it stops being, like, it stops being funny. Uh, and, and I'm going to just show one example um, 
I mean, everybody is hating on JavaScript all the time, it's, but it's not like Python is better if you if you look closely. They just made they just managed to make a very nice like sort of exterior, which JavaScript didn't. Um, right. So let's start with something very simple. You you have a uh, an attribute read. You say x dot a or x dot m, and um, you you could think, oh, it's just a hash map lookup, and you're done. But internally, there are all kinds of meta hooks from various versions of Python that were added for various reasons, and you can you can sort of use meta programming to change all kinds of things about that process. And the, it's basically a very very large method in your interpreter that has tons of cases and and weird combinations of cases and and um, Actually, so this is a very simplified uh, record of what's happening. So the first thing that you do is you can completely override um, the whole method lookup process by defining a special method uh, called underscore underscore get attribute. So the first thing you do is you do a method lookup on, on your object, and if you find, or on the class of that object, if you find this special method, you're just going to call it with the name of the attribute, return whatever that returns, and you're done. This is usually not the case. Um, so what you usually do next is, but you, you always need to do it because if it's there, you, you need to follow the semantics. But what you do next is, the first thing, the next thing really is you look whether the object's dictionary, hash map, has this field. Um, if it's there, uh, you just return the object, done. And of course, dictionary is hiding tons of details because in practice it's not the dictionary, it's some kind of hidden class or something that really tells you what the dictionary looks like, but not, not really hash map. Right, so the next step is, if it's not in the dictionary, it's probably a method. So the next step is you walk the method resolution order of the object, which is a complex thing because Python has multiple inheritance. Uh, and for every element in the method resolution order, you look in the class, in the, in the method dictionary of the class, and see whether the method is there. If it's there, um, good. So, but then you're not done. So you found a method. But what do you do with the method? You, you don't just return it. You, you start sort of recursively start searching for attributes on the method. And you, you start looking whether the method object that you found somewhere in the, in the method resolution order, we check whether that has a special method called underscore underscore get. And if the attribute has that get thing, you call it and you return the result. And, um, and, and then you're done in that case. But if the attribute isn't found at all anywhere here, there is another special method called get after that, that you will call um, I mean, it's kind of funny, right? You have these things like, with small variations. And the difference is, this is always called, this is only called if it's not there. Um, right, and then if that's also not there, you raise an error. So how do you make, like a priori, how do you make good assembler out of that? I mean, without <laughs> extensive runtime feedback, it, it's very hard to, to know. Like if I just show you this snippet of code, it's, you can't really do anything except produce a call into the runtime that does all that shit. Um, right. I mean, and of course, it, I mean, w what happens when you apply hints and do all the work is that in the end, if it's really, if it's really a field, you will just read the field out of the object and be done, right? The code that you get is, is, is basically two instructions. But, um, uh, and if it's a method, it will even just be turned into a, a type card, and that's it. But um, you still, at any point, need to be able to deal with all this complexity because it's really used. It's not like, it's not like. I mean, ninety percent uh, of the call sites. I mean, I'm making up a number here, but most of the call sites uh, don't do the complicated cases, but a lot of them do, and you need to be prepared to deal with them at any point. <coughs> right. Okay. Uh, cool. So we did all that stuff. Let's. What did, does it actually help? Uh, the benchmarks are old, and benchmarks are always lies anyway. So um, don't believe anything. If you want to use PyPy, you should. You need to measure your own application because that's the only. That's the only relevant number that you. That you should care about. But in order to get sort of a rough feel of the, sort of, the order of, orders of magnitude involved, um, here's some here's some average speed up numbers for sort of Python implementations. And we, we can start with, we can start with sort of th the traditional interpreter and it's normalized to that. So C Python task speed one. Uh, and then Psycho, which is an old and now discontinued uh, JIT for, for Python that one of the PyPy authors wrote a couple of years ago. And I guess it's sort of the Lua JIT of the, PyPy, well, the, the Python world, but it's dead. So um, at, anyway, at the point it, it gave you on the set of benchmarks, it gave you a 64% speed up, which 
you may deem a little bit disappointing given how Python, how slow Python can be. Um, right, if you just take the PyPy interpreter after translating it to C, um, without any of the JIT stuff, you get like more than a, two, a 2x slowdown. The reason is, of course, R Python is a much higher level language, so all the C level tricks that C Python does are not really there. So uh, you pay you pay a, a price for the modularity that, that yeah, the improved modularity of, of your interpreter. Um, if you add the meta tracer, but you don't add any type feedback hints, you get that slowdown back. But okay, so now you haven't won anything. But then the, the real thing that you care about is if you add all the type feedback hints and all, all the sort of um, semantics explaining hints, you, you get a like, large factor improvement. But as I said, I mean, how large that factor is very much depends on your program. It seems to be between two times and 10 times faster and yeah, like, whatever that means. But you, you really need to measure yourself. Um, right, okay, shootout, everybody hates shootout. Um, but, and, and the numbers are all too, but in order to get sort of a rough idea at, at um, where things stood uh, when I did the benchmarks, compared to V8, Lua, Jin, and Hotspot, we obviously can't reach those levels, but we're sort of within a factor of five, which I, which I would count as okay. Um, right, oh, demo, yes, I have a demo. Um, I mean, the problem with bench dem demoing, demoing JITs is intensely boring, right? I mean, you, you do the same thing twice and, uh, and you get the same result, just, just you, don't, you have to wait less. So we started doing image processing as, as demos. And I mean, by now, probably a third of the people have seen it. And also my, my uh, webcam driver is broken, so the picture's upside down. But um, the idea is that what you do is you use a Python program to do edge detection on whatever, um, whatever uh, stream of images that the, that the webcam gives you. And if you then see Python, I mean, you already see that you had to wait for quite a bit to get a frame, right? So it's not, it's not 30 frames per second, it's 30 seconds per frame or something. <laughs> also, I did a grave mistake this morning. Usually I wear a striped shirt, but um, yeah, that's, that's my head upside down, right? Um, okay, that's not good. So if you do the same thing with PyPy, well, of course it's a demo, so it works nicely, and you can sort of wave around. And I need something stripey. Is this stripey? No, maybe. Yeah. Okay. And I mean the fun. The reason why this is fun is because the code is not really. I mean the code is kind of nice, right? It's. I mean it's not super nice, but it, it's it's object oriented, and and it uses like iterator objects and tons of tuples and indexing and, and, and quite a bit, I mean, it covers quite a bit of the Python object model and like in every iteration you, you produce these tuples that you need to allocate and do shit and, and index and then you, we can look at where, like the indexing is, is done on this special class that we wrote somewhere which basically uh, defines a get item. So all the indexing is, is, um, is a method call that uh, contains other method calls and, and does stuff and does object model things and global lookups and, and of course at the end it's really shrunk down and you really just get uh, you really get, just get the assembler that you might sort of expect that manipulates the pixels and, and that's it. Okay, cool. So questions about about PyPy? Is there any situation in which you can eliminate the hash uh, lookup uh, and turn it into something like a C structure? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, all the all the instances don't have hash maps, okay. so it's always instance lookups are always turned into just a struct field read, right? And and hash map lookups on the global dictionary and on the class dictionaries get removed completely. But if you if you if the user defines a dictionary and operates on that, uh, we're less good at reasoning about that, right? I mean, we can still do it sometimes, but it, it's a bit harder. Slava? So, what's your thoughts about, like, there is a notion of monomorphism, polymorphism, megamorphism that is easy to define for languages like Java, where you have explicit classes, but in the dynamic type languages, the notions that programmers have in their head are different from the notions that 
DMs has, because something that looks monomorphic to a person does not necessarily look monomorphic to a DM. So what's your thought about reconciling this between the programmers and the same? You mean just in, in communication or? Well, or meaning allowing them to better see what is actually monomorphic. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, as I already alluded to, I mean, that it's really something that, that we're looking at right now because, I mean, a very simple example is if, if you have you you have a base class that defines a method and lots of subclasses, then and and you have a call site that, that uses many subclasses, but it always calls the base implementation. The programmer might say, "Oh, that that's monomorphic, right?" But um, then, if you really comp just compare the class pointers, you will get different paths that then look identical. Um, and and I actually think that the right thing to do is to move the VM notion of monomorphism more more in the direction of what right I mean to fix it that way. But um, I'm not sure whether I, I mean, it's ongoing work, I'm not sure whether that, that is possible or, I mean, yeah. But I don't know, I mean, the, the, I'm not even that sure that the notion of monomorphism on the VM level is that obvious if you, ha if you have this kind of stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, it's so right? I mean, the notion of monomorphism here is you take the same flow through the implementation, right? Yeah. But, um, I mean, it's not sort of it's it's not that obvious what an equivalent definition on the Python level even looks like, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, I agree that it, it, it's not it's not obvious how to. And how to share it between different language implementations as well, because you do define like classes and versions, and this is kind of shared between different implementations. The trick that you do in all kinds. Of right, the trick is shared, but not the. I mean, right? Uh, yeah, it, it's not. It's. I don't have an answer, I think. Maybe like one more annotation will solve it. Oh, yes. <laughs> one more annotation will always solve everything. Um, right. OK. More questions? Yes? Are there any other live mode interpreters? Or VMs? Um, are there any other languages in yes. the R language? Yes. That's what the next slides are about. Um, right. So I mean, it would, be, it would be a little bit boring to say that you write this uh, JIT framework and then only apply it to one language, right? So, I mean, in order to sort of verify that what we're doing, um, I mean, that we're even fulfilling our motivation is, is we have to go and, and do more languages with it. And the thing, the language that I did quite a while ago is, is a prolog interpreter. And a prolog interpreter is interesting for two reasons. One reason is that it's very small, right? I mean, it will be, you, can, you can show a prolog interpreter in a talk. Um, so so it, it shouldn't take too long to write an interpreter for it in our Python. On the, other, on the other hand, Prolog is a very different language than Python. So um, it's also useful for that reason because if you can sort of, if you can do those two relatively different and red, I mean, actually quite extremely different languages and get sort of good effects, you can argue that, okay, the approach is, is general. Um, right, so as we've seen, Prolog has a very, in, in Paul's talk, um, Prolog has a very different execution model than Python. I mean, it, it has uh, multiple solutions. If you notice that I intentionally didn't say non-determinism. Um, it has multiple solutions. It has backtracking. It has uh, logical variables. It has a very, very different data model. And, and the idea is that, I mean, the observation is that, that you can still get decent performance improvements on, on this uh, rather simple um, prolog interpreter that I wrote in RPython. And, um, what I didn't do is, is move towards any of those really low-level tricks that Paul was showing. What I did do instead was really the nice high-level object-oriented code that you might expect. So you really have a class that represents a variable, and a class that represents terms, and then you have nice methods that do the unification in the, in the recursive method calling way that you might expect. And um, the cool thing is that if the tracer just looks at the, all that stuff, it will shrink down and produce machine code that is very similar to what, uh, what a product com um, compiler might produce. But without having to think hard about how do we cleverly represent terms in just the right way that things match up. And, um, and, and actually, I, I don't understand all of the tricks that the traditional pro engines did. It, it's about 15,000 lines of code with quite a few primitives implemented, uh, built-ins implemented. It has about 70 hints. And yeah, the performance, I mean, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the performance is okay. So it's beating SWI Prolog um, on a number of 
of, of benchmarks by a little bit. Uh, it doesn't really have a chance against the, against the sort of long maintained commercial control compiler. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so that's all the questions about Prolog. Good. So in, in summary, we've written, we've written this R Python metadata framework where the hope is that you can reuse that uh, framework for, for a number of languages and share that framework between different languages. And in order to use the framework, you I mean, only you need to write an interpreter for your language in order to specify how the language works, and then add a number of hints to communicate with the MetaJIT framework in order to tell it to A, where, where is the interpreter, where is the dispatch loop, and B, like how, how is the language used, what are the assumptions that the optimizer should make about, about the language use. It can support languages as different as Prolog and Python, and we have a number of other implementations of various completenesses and usefulnesses. Can you pluralize these things? Um, <laughs> so there is, a, there is a PHP interpreter that was a startup for a while. It, it, it's relatively decent. There is a, a Ruby that, that we've seen a little bit about in, in Chris' talk yesterday. Um, we have a, a small talk, um, a racket implementation. I've wrote, I mean, SQLite actually turns out to be a very nice bytecode VM. So last, no, two years ago, we, we wrote an output implementation of, um, of the query execution for SQLite. And you can win a bit, not, not too much, but you can win a bit. And then there are some people who've written um, CPU emulators, Berkin is sitting there. So if you, if you want to know how, to, how the CPU emulator part works, you, you can talk to them. Um, right, and, and basically it, it all works, it's not, it's not too hard, and like, it basically turns out that the motto, like, what you get is basically 80% of, of a good JIT with with very little effort. And, and it, of course, it's, it's quite far from what Hotspot gives you, but compared to what you get by sort of sitting down and starting to write your interpreter C, and then sort of, as a single person, um, you, you just, you really don't stand a chance. Right. Okay, that's it for me, thank you.